Hey there, everybody. How you doing? Good morning. It's Lee Stranahan. I'm here in my apartment, just a couple blocks from CrowdStrike, the offices of CrowdStrike in fabulous downtown Crystal City, Virginia. By the way, it depends which way you go, whether Crystal City is fabulous or not. There's some directions where it's a little sketchy, but mostly it's fabulous. How's everybody doing? I'll get the usual stuff out of the way. Please join citizenjournalismschool.com. You can join right now, Citizen Journalism School. I have got a video I made for you there that explains why it's a good time to join and all the money you can save, plus talks about the Citizen Journalism and Activism Conference we have coming up in November. So I want to alert you, do, and do me a favor, retweet this puppy. You really, you really need to be aware of how the mainstream media lies about stuff. So somebody sent me a story last night, and this is, it's not just the national mainstream media. It's not just the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN. It's things like the Idaho Statesman, right? So somebody sent me a story last night. Let, let's, let's, back, let's backtrack on this. What the claim is, literally the headline, is that Russia and Breitbart joined forces to create anti-refugee hysteria in Twin Falls. Now, this is really insulting to the citizens of Twin Falls. This is really insulting. And I hope they push back on this. Uh, I was the person who went up to Twin Falls, and the Twin Falls story by a guy named Bill Nanny says that, you know, Breitbart sent a representative to create, I, I didn't create anything. Here's what happened. Ready? Here's the facts in Twin Falls. Twin Falls has had a refugee program since the 80s. Initially, the refugee program was bringing in uh, largely Asian refugees. Remember the Vietnamese boat people? Remember that? Because, you know, these were refugees who were created by communism. Remember, remember those, right? Those are the refugees they didn't talk about so much. But anyway, there was a lot of stuff in the news about them. Uh, and those refugees settled in places like like Twin Falls, among other places, Twin Falls has had a refugee program. And those refugees, what have they done? What did the, what did the, the Vietnamese refugees do? They built businesses, right? That's what they did. I've been to them. I've been to the Vietnamese market, right? And in, in Twin Falls. I've been to the Asian market up in Twin Falls. And then the refugee program changed, okay? And it changed with the Bosnian refugees, that was part of it with that conflict. But then in the past few years, the refugees, due to wars that the United States started in places like Iraq and fomented in places like Syria, changed to be almost exclusively Muslim refugees from Middle Eastern and African countries. In fact, the refugee program now is almost exclusively Muslim refugees, almost exclusively, vast majority. Okay. Now, there's a few issues with that. One of the issues is Depending, depending on how you look at it, is the assimilation aspect. Because Islam has an anti-assimilation aspect. If you know anything about Islam, and if you don't, look into it. Look into it a little bit. Islam believes in political dominance. This is important to understand, and it's not new. When I say look into Islam, I mean literally do the work, study the history of Islam. Don't even do it, do it from Islamic scholars who, who, who know the history. 
But if you look at the death, if you go back to the beginning of Islam, where you have the Prophet Muhammad, and he goes from Medina to Mecca, right? And he goes from a position of, I'll, I'll just give you a real brief history, right? Where uh, he's not in power and is sort of part of the oppressed people, then takes power and it becomes a ruler. Then after the death of Muhammad, within a decade or so, I forget what it is, I think it's like six years, immediately the Muslims who are, who are there invade North Africa. Go look into it. That happened immediately. Islam is in favor of dominance. It's a big theme. If you, if you listen to Al-Qaeda recruiting videos or anything like that, they talk about this. And part of that dominance is a non-assimilation, right? And, and part of that non-assimilation is stuff like Muslims, I don't care where you are, if you're an American Muslim, you're supposed to learn Arabic. Now, uh, Christianity, for instance, if we use that as a contrast, has no such, you, could, you can be a Christian and just in whatever language you're in. The Bible's been translated into every language. I'm not even saying this in a comparative religion, better or worse way, it's just different. So there's a non-assimilation aspect, you dig, built into Islam. By the way, interestingly enough, because they're both very Middle Eastern religions, Judaism has a similar thing, right? If you learn, you, you, you're supposed to learn Hebrew because the Torah and the other main documents are in Hebrew, but there's Christianity, I'm just saying, not even saying better or worse, it's just different and it's interesting. Of course, there's other aspects of Judaism and Islam that are similar such as the prohibitions on eating pork, for instance. And again, that's not a big, I say that, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm pro pork eating, I'll admit that, I'm pro pork eating, but I'm just saying that, that there's some similarities culturally, right, between, you know, it's interesting, as much as Islam and Judaism fight, that's why I say it, it's an interesting little thing. As much as they fight, there's some similarities between them and certain assimilation aspects, certain, it's just interesting. It's because they come from, it's because they come from common cultural roots. I'm just saying. We live in a dangerous time where it's, you know, if you, if you say facts, you can get in a lot of trouble for doing that. So I'm not saying this because like I say, I'm not saying anything Islamophobic or anti-Semitic or anything, I'm just pointing it out. So the, the non-assimilation aspect of Islam has led to a refugee program that's different. And the other part of the refugee program, in other words, people started noticing that women in hijabs were showing up at Target in Twin Falls. And but there's other economic aspects of it which is the refugees, and by the way, who don't, you know, who, who whatever. I met, I met refugees in Twin Falls, and I met refugees from African countries, and I met refugees who were Muslim, some, and uh, were nice. So this is not a, they're mean or anything like that. But when you've got a place like Twin Falls, it's a small rural community you notice the difference. Now, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. You, you notice the difference there. And so what happened was, there were groups that were talking about this refugee issue long before I or anyone heard about it. And this idea that's being perpetrated by this guy, Bill Nanny, is insulting to the citizens of Twin Falls. It's assuming that what they saw with their own eyes and bothered them enough where they would have meetings about it. But this is always what's happened. This is what's happened in Twin Falls. This is the reporting that needs to be done. And it's the reporting that I did. The people, the citizens of Twin Falls, 
who had concerns were like, well, hey, what's going on about this, were insulted at every single turn. They were insulted. Oh, you're not blah, blah, blah. You're anti-American. You know, you know we're, you're, you're xenophobic. You're whatever. You're Islamophobic. And that bothers me. And they were insulted by their government and by the media. I'm going to say it again. They were insulted by the government and media. By the way, don't, at, don't take my word for it. If anyone in Twin Falls is watching, and you see this on Facebook or you see this on Twitter, point out that what I'm saying is true, but do me a favor. Do, take the time to write a letter or nine to the Idaho statesman and this ninny nanny. See what I did there? This guy, Bill Nanny, who wrote this story, and let him know that, I, you know, like I say, so it, this is all interesting because the New York Times Magazine just sent a photographer out to take photos of me because, you know, when you're this good looking, obviously the New York Times needs to send a photographer, but they send it out because they have a story coming up in the New York Times Magazine about Twin Falls. And a reporter talked to me for hours and hours about it over the past few months. And I don't know what the story's going to be. When the New York Times Magazine comes out with a story, they just did a big story on RT and Sputnik saying that Russia's built this big machine, this propaganda machine. How many people watch RT and Sputnik? I wish you'd, you should listen to Fault Lines, my radio show in the morning, 7 to 10, although it's a little hard to listen to right now because it's not live on the app or the website. And it should be, because it's awesome. But you can listen to it on iTunes or whatever. It's a great show. I wish people would listen to it. The other programming, you know, as a person who works for the company, sure, you should listen to it, but I, it's, it's all leftist. It's not pro-Trump. We're at a point where you have to really be aware how the media is lying to you. Now, I'll give you one other example. I was reading some stuff from uh, a writer named Natasha Bertrand at Business Insider, and she's written another a number of series of stories about how Russians, and she, they, they don't even, watch how they lie to you, because they want to conflate Russia with the Russian government. Every Everything's Putin aligned, Putin backed, Kremlin aligned, Kremlin backed. You notice that? They always say Kremlin aligned. Right? But they, they're doing this to distract you from phrases like CIA aligned or FBI aligned, which make a lot more frickin' sense. Here, let me do it with CrowdStrike because it makes a lot more sense. FBI aligned cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike. What do I mean by FBI aligned? Because I'm not actually doing what the mainstream media is doing. They use a, a six degrees of separation thing to say Kremlin aligned. I'll be very direct. CrowdStrike, the cybersecurity firm hired by the DNC to take out Bernie Sanders and then to take out Donald Trump was founded by Sean Henry. Go look it up. Don't take my word for it. S-H-A-W-N, Henry. Former head of cybersecurity for the FBI, co-founded CrowdStrike, the company that's just right down here. By the way, Lockheed Martin's right down there and everything else. All the defense contractors are around here where I live in Crystal City. Okay, So FBI aligned, what I mean by that is Sean Henry's a guy, if you look it up, he's hung out and vacationed with, I believe you can find that pretty easily, Robert Mueller and, and knows Comey and stuff like that. And so when James Comey testifies three times, FBI aligned James Comey testifies in front of Congress three times that he asked the DNC for the servers, the FBI asked the DNC for the servers, and the DNC refused to cooperate multiple times at various levels. Go watch my interview with Andrew Feinberg. When I bring up this issue, it takes 10 minutes for Andrew Feinberg, because basically at the end of the day, he's just a suck-up member of the media, right, who happened to have gotten hired by Sputnik, but just wants everybody in the media to like him. 
So, FBI-aligned Andrew Feinberg, why do I say that? Because he admits in that same interview that he did an interview with the FBI about Sputnik and immediately asked them if he could write about it. I'm going to say that again. His concern with the FBI, when he left the interview, he asked them if he could write about it. What does that tell you about his motivations? Anything? He says it right in the interview. Go watch it. He wanted people to know. I've, I've talked to the FBI. I didn't want people to know. Because they asked me to be quiet about it. It was about the Steubenville story a few years ago. Eventually, there was a conviction of KY Anonymous, a guy named Derek Lostutter, who was convicted for his role in hacking in that story. But years before he was convicted, I spoke to the FBI and told them what I knew about it because I thought there were serious federal crimes involved, like the hacking that, it, that he got convicted for. I didn't talk about it. I could have. It was interesting. But I didn't talk about it. So he leaves the meeting with Sputin. He leaves the meeting with FBI and media lab. Can I write about it? Then what he does is instead of writing about it, because they said, please don't write about it. No, they said, no, you shouldn't write about it. They can't order you not to write about it, but they ask him not to. So instead, he talks to Michael Isikoff. Michael Isikoff, who's currently being sued by Carter Page, apparently, because Michael Isikoff, reporter for Yahoo, who's a coward, Michael Isikoff, you're a coward. I call out cowards all the time, right? I call out cowardly reporters all the time. You notice these, these cowards don't, by cowards, look at my interview with Feinberg. You'll see why they're cowardly. You'll see why Cernovich is cowardly. You'll see why Alex Marlowe's cowardly. You'll see why Isikoff is cowardly. You'll see why Brian Stelter is cowardly. You'll see the way this guy, Jim Rutenberg, from the New York Times is cowardly. Watch what I did to Andrew Feinberg. Have you watched it? Did you watch the interview? I can be aggressive, but I wasn't aggressive. All I was was factual. So what they don't want, what Alex Marlowe doesn't want, what Cernovich doesn't want, is to sit down next to me where I won't be aggressive with them and I'll let them make fools of themselves because they simply don't know the stories. They simply don't know the facts. These are elitist liars. I'm sick of so many people in the media. They're elitist liars who don't know the facts and when get they and they fold under questioning. And you should be sick of him too. He's deathly scared. He's absolutely scared. You don't block someone for asking questions. I'll say it again. I challenge him to a debate anytime. Anytime, Mike, anytime you want to discuss journalism, anytime. We'll do it for charity, whatever you want. That they're all scared. But like I say, I don't put I like I don't put Cernovich or Marlowe or Boyle into a different category than Stelter or this guy Rutenberg or uh, Natasha. You can do it too. Natasha, you want to do it too. This guy Bill Nanny. I picked up, when I saw what Bill Nanny had written, I picked up the phone. I said, here's my phone number. Next time you want to talk about me, don't lie about me. Here's my phone number. You're a reporter? Call me. Call me. We'll get the facts right. I'm tired of these people. It's the least populist thing in the world to use journalism as a one-way medium. So I'm going to do what I do and put my money where my mouth is. Any questions? You, you wouldn't consider Stelter an elitist? Have him call me. Why doesn't he have him on the show? He's a complete elitist. They're, 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 they're stupid. I mean, I appreciate them mentioning the name. Yeah, Dave, Dave Lugo's a great 
great guy, great filmmaker, and I was glad we had him on the show and we'll have him on again. On Monday in Fault Lines, we have Bill Binney. If you think that was an eye-opener, that'll be interesting. Of course it'll be Feinberg 2.0. Why does Cernovich talk big but hides from me? I'll tell you why. He talks big because it's a psychological technique of talking big. These people are professional manipulators. That's what they are. Professional manipulators. Cernovich is a professional manipulator. Before he got into politics, he was trying to earn money telling guys how to sleep with women, right? Something that apparently he was qualified to instruct people on since he'd been indicted for rape or sexual assault at one point. I'm not sure how that qualifies you for that, but that's literally what happened. He's talked about it, but he, he doesn't like to talk about it that much. Right? Yeah, professional troll. And then what happened was, Mike saw what a guy like Milo was doing, which is if you're provocative and talk about free speech, and that's kind of it. You don't talk about... See, again, I could do that. I, I was talking to Eric, my producer, about this. I've seen a lot of people in the last year who just, they talk about free speech, and then that's it. They don't have a lot of depth beyond that. They can talk about free speech. They can't really talk about, like, the history of the left or how we got to this position, or they can't talk authoritatively about the Frankfurt School or... They don't have a deep understanding of the Ukrainian diaspora or whatever. But they can just say, free speech, social justice warrior. They're picking up on what Andrew Breitbart talked about, but Andrew Breitbart at least had intellectual depth. So they're shallow. And you can see, like, Cernovich's shallowness all the time because he repeats the same things over and over. Like, literally, when he's in the middle of a sentence, he'll, he'll say the same thing three times. It's a stalling technique. It's a way you can make things take longer. It's a trick you can use in order to stretch out a lack of material. See what I just did there? I said the same thing three times. You see, you see it? I just did that. I'm just showing you what it is. And I did it better than he does. Because I at least tried to rephrase them. He doesn't even rephrase them. He's very, it's very interesting. He's not bright. He's admittedly made a huge amount of money after his wife became a successful lawyer, and he wasn't. And he got paid by alimony. I don't know. He's a, he, he, is, he is in his own way a fascinating guy, but not in the way he thinks he is. I, I, guess, I guess what's perpetually perplexing to me is why people fall for it. I just, I'm con very confused. Have you not looked into his background? I just, I'm perpetually confused by it. But Stelter's the same way. They're, they're all just, I mean, he's, Stelter, sure, doesn't have a, a rape charge against him and then get alimony from his ex-wife. There's some differences. Not quite the same. You know, there's some differences. But all of these people, they all are playing the same game. They're all playing the same game. And again, they want and again I give I give Andrew Feinberg credit for sitting down. But I know why they don't want to sit down. Any time, any of you. And I keep pointing it out to emasculate them. I keep pointing it out because I want to point out daily. You see, for again, a guy like Cernovich talks tough. He's not tough. And as I pointed out every day, some people are like, well, gee, Mike, come on, what are you doing? Mike, what are you doing? That's what I want to happen. 
because what you'll see is people have been calling him out on this for months. <coughs> months now. It's almost autumn. Months now. Aren't, and, and eventually people will go, well, gee, I guess he really is a coward. I guess Alex Marlowe really isn't going to talk about the Ukraine DNC thing or address any of the stuff Lee said about him. I guess Matt Boyle, who's been, and Matt and Alex have been effectively neutered now that Steve Bannon's back. Right? And I do the same thing with the mainstream media. When you see that they only show you one side, that's the key to all of this. They only want you to hear their side of it. I was perfectly comfortable letting Feinberg talk. Well, and I'd be completely comfortable letting a guy like Cernovich talk. Completely comfortable. But he knows what would happen. Mike knows what would happen. I'll let him talk. <laughs> He's, he likes it. I'd let him talk. I let Andrew Feinberg talk, and it didn't go well. And Bill Nanny, forgive me, Bill Nanny, that was, I, that was unintentional. But this guy up at the Idaho Statesman, Bill, I'm emasculating you too, pal. You too. You too, buddy. You want to say that Russians and Breitbart were behind what was clearly a case of you as part of the media covering up what was going on in Twin Falls? No, I don't think so. Anyway, any valid questions? You know, Bill seems like, Bill Mitchell, my thoughts, Bill seems like a nice guy. He's, he's a little too Trump sycophant for me. But he seems like a nice guy. I don't have anything. No, the New York Times story has been in process for months. For months and months and months. I don't want to write an op-ed for the Twin Falls paper. When I went to Twin Falls, I wrote three times. So, yeah, I don't know. I, Bill Mitchell, I don't follow Bill Mitchell. He, he seems nice enough. I don't know. I don't know much about him. Thanks for commenting on the Statesman story. Or I, whatever, you should comment. I don't, I don't, I, maybe I... When we say Russian hacking is false, has it been proven well enough? No, it hasn't been proven well enough. The an interview with Andrew Feinberg is pinned to my Twitter profile. I'm going to leave it pinned all weekend. Yeah. Bill doesn't, uh, yeah, again, I just, I don't know Mitchell, so. It is funny. It's long. And if you think it's long to watch, imagine what it was like to do. What do I consider elite? I consider elite from a journalist when you consider journalism a one-way platform for you to express your views or your narrative and you don't bring in people to counter that narrative and you refuse to deal with people. So for instance, when Stelter had Andrew Feinberg on talking about, do you know who I'm gonna give credit to? Ready? Ready? NPR. NPR is gonna have the author of the New York Times piece on Monday and they ask my co-host on Fault Lines Garland Nixon to show up. It's the first time they've done that. It's the first time anyone's done that. Stelter at CNN has never done that, and he refuses to answer. So that's what I consider elitist. Old school elitist journalism is a one-way platform. I'm gonna tell you what's going on. This is why, and I did said this in my interview with Jason yesterday, I don't tell people, I've never told people not to listen to Cernovich. I've never told people he's wrong. I'm using him as an example. I'm not telling you not to listen to CNN. I'm calling those people out individually for their cowardice and pointing out that they don't present alternative views. They consider themselves above reproach 
and above questioning. That's why. So that's what I consider elitism in journalism. If you look at it broadly, I consider elitism the confluence between big business and big government. It's a way of maintaining money and power. That's what I consider elitism. Right? And I consider populism to be an anti-elitist philosophy where what your job is, what your job is as a journalist is to poke holes. Let me give an example of the dangers of the confluence between money and power. Okay? I'll drill down to something factual I've talked about. And I, I, in fact, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it because i got to look it up. I was talking to my son Shane about it. I gotta do. I gotta. I gotta research it more before I talk about it. Anyway, but that does that answer that question? I, I'm trying to read what people. Hang on. You may have to. Sorry. Yeah. Now NPR, I. I listen to NPR. I'm not a fan of some stuff on NPR. NPR gets some stories right, and uh, NPR has some. I mean, I, I'm. I. My advice is take in a lot of media. That's my advice. My advice is you should listen to a lot of media. My advice is you should not. If all you listen to is NPR, it's dumb. And if all you listen to is Breitbart, you're you're dumb. And if all you listen to is Sputnik, you're dumb. And if all you listen to is the New York Times, you're dumb. Don't be dumb. Take in a wide variety of media, develop critical thinking skills, and figure out the truth for yourself. Approach everything skeptically and read a wide variety of media. There's apparently no red line for intervention with North Korea. The problem with North Korea I'm I'm reading I'm reading a book right now. I mentioned uh, David Horowitz was a guest on the show yesterday. I love David. Right, Breitbart's for KKK members. You're stupid, but go ahead and read Breitbart. You you really should read Breitbart. You really should read Breitbart. By the way, the KKK were Democrats. I'm just pointing that out. That just, so it's not a good fit, actually. Um, uh, what all? Here, here's something nobody wants to hear. Ready? Nobody wants to hear this. I'm reading. So I'm reading David Horowitz's show yesterday. And I called him afterwards to thank him for coming on the show. And I mentioned that I'm reading a book by David Horowitz's son. David Horowitz's son is uh, a top Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Horace, uh, Horowitz Andreessen is one of the top VC firms in, in Silicon Valley. And... Uh, David's son wrote a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I think that's the title. And um, it's a business book, and, and what he says at the right outset, it's a, very, it's a very good book so far. I'm about a fifth of the way into it. It's very good, very interesting, lots of biographical stuff. And uh, one of the things he says is that a lot of business books focus on the easy stuff, but not the hard stuff. So let's talk about the hard stuff. North Korea's the hard stuff. Healthcare is the hard stuff. And why? Because there's a unity between both of them. There's a unity between both of them. People. People are the hard part. Let me explain. What do you do about a guy like the, the Kim dynasty. We had a good guest on Fault Lines talking about this. Where uh, uh, the current Kim, 
who's in charge. By the way, they're all supposed to be the same Kim. Did you know that? There's a weird culty thing going on in North Korea. And cults are another thing. They're tricky because of people, okay? Who is capable of, of chilling that dude out? And the answer is nobody. Have you ever had somebody, let me explain. Have you ever seen some, have you ever dealt with somebody self-destructive in your life? Have you ever had a friend or a family member who is an alcoholic or an opiate addict or something like that? Have you ever watched people spiral downwards in their life, right? Because uh, I've seen it, I've seen it with people, right? And you can't stop them. If you've ever had that experience, you can't stop them. I've told the story before. My best friend growing up, Bob, alcoholic. I knew him when he was an alcoholic. We were teenagers drinking, and everybody else stopped, and he kept going. And eventually, he died. I think he was 49, something like that. Drank himself to death had a daughter the age of my son, my older, my son Shane. She was 18, she had to move out because she was watching her father drink himself to death after being estranged from him for a long time. And I talked to Bob when his daughter came back into his life. And I said, you got a chance here to rebuild something with your daughter, don't screw it up. But boom, he went right down the bottom and he literally drank himself to death. So I've seen that, and you've probably seen it too. And if you haven't seen it, you will. I hate to break it to you, but you will. So how does that relate to North Korea? Because if you literally can't stop people from killing themselves, and by the way, people kill themselves in different ways, right? How are you gonna stop Kim from, it's, how's that gonna work? China, I don't believe China can talk that dude down, right? I don't believe the U.S. can, clearly. And by the way, if you put a bullet in his head, that's one way to stop it. But A, good luck with that. And B, that's going to cause all kinds of problems because he's created a cult of personality and they have nuclear codes, right? So it's like, how's that going to work? So Bannon's pointed out there's no solution that doesn't involve them. They're right in South Korea. You don't want the, you don't want the South Korea. So no one likes to talk about this stuff, and everyone likes to put out these simple solutions. Oh, well, we, there's no simple solution. Sorry. I'm pointing out that some things don't have a simple solution. Health care. I mentioned that. Let's talk about health care. Here's the problem in health care. Ready? I never hear anyone talk about this. I hear people talk about, we had somebody yesterday from the Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America saying Medicaid for all. Okay, that's their solution, single payer. Okay, let me tell you the problem. It has nothing to do with who's funding it. Here's the problem. Talk to anybody who's a doctor who's a general practitioner, who sees patients. I'll go back to what I did, the Bob story I just said. Here's the, here's the problem with healthcare, ready? People. People don't really want healthcare. I know they say they do, but not really. Ask any general practitioner how many times they'll see somebody come in who weighs 400 pounds, who smokes two packs of cigarettes a day, the doctor gives them advice. Anybody guess what the doctor's advice is? Anybody guesses? Stop smoking, get some exercise, stop eating four chickens a day and drinking two liters of Coke. Right? Next year, same person comes in for a checkup. They've done none of those things. And this happens over and over and over. Right? Ask your doctor, they'll tell you. By the way, 
I'm giving an extreme example, but let's be honest, you and I are probably pretty good examples of that too. Do you go to your doctor and immediately do every single thing that they say? Don't lie. Don't lie publicly. Admit it. You know, you probably don't. Or there's a delayed reaction. This, and what is I'm saying, this is people. This is people. The problem is people. Some people are better at it than others, but the problem is people. There's a certain thing in human nature. We get told, oh, you, sh you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And we just, we just do it anyway. But here's the thing when it comes to health care. And by the way, some people are better at it, and some people do exercise, and they do, they do all that stuff, and they turn their life around. Andrew Breitbart didn't, I, I, didn't do that was trying to it was like okay I'm gonna change my diet and change then he died anyway boom because sometimes doing an exercise program right I mean this is what happened with this is what happened with Andrew unfortunately this is what happened the diet and exercise program didn't help this is why they tell you before you start diet and exercise talk to your doctor right so the the trick in healthcare is this. I think if I took a poll and put it up to a vote and I said, little Billy here is three years old and has brain cancer. Should we use taxes to chip in to help little Billy? That would get like 80% approval. Yes, we'll all help little Billy. Now, let's talk about old Billy. Old Billy's 55 years old, and his doctor's been telling him to stop smoking since he was 18. And old Billy likes smoking two packs of Marlboros red every day. And he likes his whiskey. His liver doesn't, but he likes his Jack, right? And, you know, McDonald's is cheap and easy. Now... Billy's come down, old Billy's come down with some health problems. Should we all chip in to help old Billy? That's trickier, don't you think? <laughs> right? That's a lot trickier. It's not that I want old Billy to die, because I don't. He will, and so he's going to have to deal with that, too. But, it's not that I want old Billy to die, but I don't want to pay for that Mother Hubbard, and neither do you. That's where we get like an 80% no vote. But it's all health care. And so the problem with, one of the problems was something like, oh, we'll just have the government, single payer, we'll get rid of the health insurance companies. I don't want to pay for that dude if I'm on private insurance. I don't want to pay for that dude if I'm on public insurance. That dude should be paying more. By the way, he's probably not making that much. Let's point that out about old Billy. Probably not making that much. And so what's the solution? I don't know. There's not a great solution there. I'm just saying it. Can we admit, like I say, this goes back to what I said about North Korea. At the end of the day, there's not a great solution. And people, when they get into the solution, somebody was like, well, gee, you sh somebody wants to do my job. They were like, you should talk to her about rationing. Under government health care, there's rationing. Well, guess what? Under private health care, there's rationing, too. Uh, and by the way, why is rationing bad? I'm just saying. It's Rationing's bad when the three-year-old with brain cancer is like, no, we're not helping him. But at, when it's like 55, and this is what the death panels thing, and again, people want to talk about the death panels. You know what? There's already death panels, and they just they either happen in private insurance. You see, again, everybody, everybody gets so into the argument that they forget that there's not actually a solution because it's much easier just taking a position on something that you know you can bicker about endlessly. 
again, I don't know if you've ever been divorced or you've ever broken up or anything like that. I've been through that. I've been married twice, right? And you, you, do you ever been in a relationship where you get to a point where the arguing is pretty much the relationship? My first wife and I got to that point. Most of the relationship was arguing. That was it. That was most of the relationship. That's bad. <laughs> That's bad, right? And that describes our American political system. And elitist journalists have figured out the way to, to, to keep things crappy, but they get paid. See, that's the thing. They get paid, they get paid, is to, even though there's this perpetual argument that doesn't actually solve any problems, and this is sort of the height of elitism. Let's just keep the perpetual argument going, and I'm just gonna jump in on one side. And I'm gonna know that human nature is to confirmation bias and like, oh yeah, well that guy's saying what I, yes, yes, exactly right. Socialized medicine is bad. Yes, no, don't, that, that lady's exactly right. Socialized medicine is awesome. It's not even socialized medicine, it's single payer. Totally different than socialized medicine. Oh no, it's totally the same, it's totally, but, and meanwhile, no, no one's solving the problem because solving the problem is actually harder. Talking about the problem is easy. Solving the problem is harder. So I just bring that up to you. There's a hard thing about hard things, to quote David Horowitz's son's book. There's a hard thing about hard things, right? But at the end of the day, this is what we're working on at Populist.tv. This is what we're working on with the activism thing. We're actually working, part of the idea behind doing the populist is to actually start to come up with some solutions that aren't perfect, because it's not gonna be perfect, but that are better, and that don't benefit the rich and powerful, and their suck-up minions, right? But actually benefit people, but realize that people are also the problem. Does that make sense? In other words, in other words, I'm pro-people, but people are the problem. I'm, I'll say that again. I'm in favor of people. To quote Sly and Family Stone, I love everyday people, but we're also the problem. And the reason I ask you whether you do it, and I, I like I say, I, my diabetes went untreated for years, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I bring up this stuff because I, I know personally I'm not perfect. And so one way to actually solve the problems, and this is the other thing that I don't like about any of the people, I'm like, well, you know what? I just realized there's a spiritual connection to everyone I just mentioned who's doing bad journalism. They don't sit down with me because they don't want to confront, not me, but themselves. Aha. Uh -huh. That's what's going on. They don't want to confront. If you want to know Cernovich's problem, if you want to know Alex Marlowe's problem, if you want to know Boyle's problem or Stelter's problem or Hunter Walker or Michael Isikoff, they don't want to confront themselves. And if you watch the Feinberg interview, I'm pretty good. And, and if you watch what I do in the thing, and by the way, I do it to myself. I confront myself all the time. That's why I bring up this stuff with you. Because I'm not trying to put myself in a separate category. I think that everybody, me, you, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, right? Guy behind the counter at McDonald's. I think we all share, I think we're all human beings. We all share certain characteristics. Right, And this is why things like music and comedy are universal, because there are certain universal things that go beyond ideology, go beyond politics, that make people laugh, that make people dance, what, whatever, right? There are certain things that underneath the surface we all share, and uh, they're not all positive, right? They're not all positive. 
And so I don't like the dishonesty of politics that doesn't deal with this. And let me close by talking about this moron from the Idaho statesman. I don't know who you think you're fooling. I don't know who you're sucking up to. I, I guess I do. It's just whatever the establishment is in Idaho, which I've seen it exist. But you're not doing the people a service. And they will come back and tell you that you're lying. I didn't, I wasn't the one who, like, I didn't create the situation in Twin Falls. I reported on it. Right? And I tried to make it better, and I tried to give good advice for people. I tried to be balanced about the advice I gave. Unlike you, Bill Nanny, unlike you. Unlike you. But any time, Bill, you low-level elitist, any time you want to talk, any time you want to sit down for an interview, pal, any time, let's sit down, and I'll have you confront yourself, Bill. I'll have you take a deep look at you. Why don't we do that? Anyway, my daughter's in town. She's back there. My son's over there. They're both asleep. They're both asleep. Because kids. What are you going to do? 16, 18. Anyway, I'm going to roll. My daughter's in town for a few days. It's her first time visiting me in D.C. since I've been out here. And uh, there's stuff I want to do. And she wants to have fun. And probably... She streams too, not about politics. She streams too, and probably she doesn't want to watch me do it. So I don't know how much I'll be on this weekend, but I love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.